Randall Barney is our line producer. I think we're about one minute out. We're in. We are now live. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. It's lovely to see you all. I'm very, very happy to welcome you to this month's edition of the New York Space Business Roundtable. Um, my internet was not behaving earlier, so if I sound jittery, someone just wave at me and I'll flag Lou to talk. <laughs> but. Um, we are getting ready to kick off. Everyone is on mute. We have a distinguished uh, panel uh, that will be joining Joe and Lou for this month's roundtable. Um, I want to let everybody know that the chat is open. Uh, it looks like some folks have already discovered it, so wonderful. Um, yes, um, so the chat is open and you have the ability to post any questions that you have or even just comments in the chat. We will at one o'clock be concluded the formal program, but we will then have an open ended audience participation program for, that will run for about 15 minutes. And so uh, if your questions have not been answered by then, we invite you to stay and and participate in that segment. And with that, I think we can advance uh, over to Lou. Well, thank you, Tamara, and uh, we appreciate you opening. Um, and welcome, everyone. If it's the third Wednesday of the month, it must be the New York Space Business Roundtable. Uh, I'm Lou Zaccarella. I'm with uh, SSPI, and I'm here along with my colleague, Joe Fargnoli of the New York Space Alliance. We just heard from Tamara, uh, Tamara Bond-Williams of SSPI, who you uh, know. And uh, today we have Randall Barney of World Teleport Association, serving as our line producer as well. Uh, before we get going, I have to shout out the supporters and the partners uh, of the round table. And you can see them up there on the screen. Uh, we really appreciate the financial support of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg and their trade and investment office here in New York. Uh, we appreciate the support of New Space New York and also two organizations, the Washington Space Business Roundtable and uh, Randy's organization, the World Teleport uh, Association. And we can give you more information on WTA uh, as we move through the program. Um, our media partners are Space News, and you'll be hearing from two of their uh, top journalists today. And I also wanna give a special shout out to the supporter of uh, this uh, series that we're doing on uh, economic development and uh, communities and nations, uh, Rice Space Institute, led of course uh, by Dr. David Alexander. And we really do appreciate um, what they've done uh, to organize this particular panel and to support SSPI all along. So thank you all, we can't do this stuff without you. And um, hopefully you out there will support these organizations uh, as you see fit. Okay. Um, you know, Scotland is where we start today uh, because it really is one of the centers of the world. It has been in, an inventive land for a long time. And what we thought we would do today is just to show you one example of something that was invented in Scotland that is important to uh, billions of people. And so with that, we will show you an invention from Scotland. They could invent golf. <laughs> oh, they could have a couple of Guinness, and then the next thing you know, what's here's my idea for a sport. I knock a ball into a gopher hole. <laughs> oh, you mean like pool? No, forget pool. That was a straight stick. A little broken stick. I whack a ball into a gopher hole. <laughs> oh, you mean like croquet? Oh, no, not croquet. That's a push it sport. <laughs> I put the hole hundreds of yards away. <laughs> oh, kind of like a bowling alley. Oh, no way! I push it in the way! I 
whipped up in the way like trees and bushes. So you whack the ball and you're sitting there whacking away and you feel like you're gonna have a stroke. <laughs> That's what we'll call it, because every time you hit the ball, you think you're gonna die. <laughs> and right near the end, they'll put a nice flat bit with a tiny flag to give you hope. <laughs> I'll put a pool and a sandbox to grab your ball. <laughs> to do this one time, oh no, 18 damn times! <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. are, are they laughing, Tamara? Are they? Um, well, there is a bit more than even golf to Scotland, of course. Uh, in Arthur Herman's book, the historian Arthur Herman, How the Scots Invented the Modern World, uh, you'll read a true story of how Western Europe's poorest nation at the time created our world and everything in it, or at least made crucial contributions to science, philosophy, literature, education, medicine, commerce, and politics. Contributions that have formed and nurtured the West and its familiar economic and technological formation, right up to the present commercial space era. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So it's natural for us to ask What's next, Scotland? It turns out one answer may be commercial space and its next iteration. Uh, but in this era of space and satellites, there will be a battle, a battle among economic development agencies and political leaders in cities and states and nations to attract that investment, retain and grow talent, and ensure, of course, that golf courses are pristine for that quality of life that they'll demand. I think we have a really interesting discussion coming up today, that convergence of economic development, national development, and commercial space as our industry continues to play uh, a more prominent role. Before I turn it over to my colleague, Joe Fargnoli, to introduce our roundtable and to get the discussion going, I wanna let you know that for you in the audience, we want you to be thinking about today's big question. And you can see it up there. And that is the question we'll be asking today as uh, this runs underneath uh, the discussion. Is commercial space investment and promotion a winning strategy? Okay, to help lead us down the path to answering that question and others, I wanna turn the first segment over to two of our industry's best journalists for their report. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you once again, our friend, Jason Rainbow. Jason is a senior staff writer at Space News and his colleague, Deborah Werner. Deborah is the Silicon Valley correspondent uh, for the publication. And by the way, Deborah's article in February, Space News called State Fight uh, is about uh, our topic today as it relates to states here in America. And it's a, it's a terrific report and we really encourage you to read that. So uh, Deborah and Jason, uh, welcome to the New York Space Business Roundtable. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Well, it's great to see you both. Um, this is really the significant digits report um, brought uh, online. And, and Jason, I would just kind of like to ask you, uh, what are we looking at currently with regard to industry investments and perhaps as it relates to Scotland and uh, the issue at hand today? That's a timely question, because uh, I thought it'd be useful to give some key takeaways from a report the UK Space Agency put out last week that has exactly that, some of the latest growth statistics of Scotland and the UK Space Agency. And I think it's particularly interesting because, well, for this discussion, because it um, underlines the increasingly important role that Scotland is playing for meeting the UK's broader space ambitions. Although England and, and particularly, uh, particularly in and around London still pulls in the lion's share of investments and activity for the UK's uh, space sector. But according to the uh, UK Space Agency's data, space employment in Scotland grew by nearly 9.6% in 2020 to 8,440, which means uh, a fifth of the UK's space workforce is now in Scotland. Um, and UK space sector as a whole saw its job total rise by 6.7% to nearly 47,000. That's about 0.14% of the the UK workforce. Uh, of course, a lot of the growth in Scotland comes as they ramp up over there for new vertical launch facilities that are coming online soon. And my, I know my colleague Deborah is going to touch on a lot of that. Um, but that is to say, the, the amount of money, 
the, the space industry generated across the UK, uh, which maybe for my, uh, the, my friends uh, who are outside of Europe, uh, Scotland, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland actually declined uh, about 1.7% in real terms compared with the previous year to 16.5 billion pounds. And that says it's important to note that this is against the background of a, a pandemic that helped the broader UK economy shrink by 9.9% in, in 2020. And the number of space organizations in the UK has also grown on average nearly 21% per year since 2012. And the latest figures put that number at 1,293 different organizations. I'm realizing now I probably should have come here with some visual aids, so apologies for that. I hope you're, hope you're following along, but only 101 of those, so about 8%, are headquartered in Scotland and they generated just 141 million pounds for the UK space sectors, 16.5 billion pounds in income. But even still, if you take out the number of people employed in the space industry in London and the southeast of England, Scotland is, is by far the most populous and the UK expects spaceports in Scotland uh, England and Wales will generate more investments and in jobs in the coming years alongside the growth of regional uh, space clusters and emerging technologies such as in space manufacturing and debris removal. And the UK has a, a national space strategy to be a leader in these emerging technologies and has given Astro scale a lot of investment, for instance. Um, the UK also counted nearly £6 billion of investments in UK space organisations over the past decade which is said places the country as the, the second largest attractor of private investment in emerging space companies in the world. Um, however, more than 70% of that 6 billion went to uh, just one company, satellite operator OneWeb. Um, and the UK Space Agency actually surveyed space companies in the UK as part of, of this report. And about a third of those that responded pointed to a challenging investment landscape um, across the UK and, and Europe uh, especially when compared to the experience of companies in places uh, elsewhere, like, like the US. Um, so that's something Scotland and, and the UK will need to get on top of. It's going to turn into this bustling orbital launch hub. Um, but there's also a lot of progress here too, of course. The UK Space Agency was, was only founded in 2010, and I'm, I'm sure they'll be hoping to uh, benefit from coming about as the, the space industry shifted to this commercial mindset. It was created within uh, and is part of that. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's the latest we have in terms of how the industry is growing in Scotland and the UK. Uh, I hope that helps. And, um, and my colleague, Dara, will now uh, give a, a bit more insight into what they have coming up in terms of uh, orbital launches and, and space clusters and, and everything else in Scotland. Hey, Jason, thanks so much. That, as, as always, that was impeccable, uh, excellent. And, uh, maybe a little later we can talk about what we mean when we talk about challenging uh, investment landscape uh, with you and, and our panelists, um, but that's terrific. Deborah, I'm going to hold up your article here that I referred to in the February issue. See how I've uh, made notes there? And so uh, I will hand it off to you. Thank you. Uh, Scotland is a very interesting place to talk about because for nearly two decades, it's been an important hub of new space before we even called it new space. Um, I'm not sure that Clyde Space knew it was part of this international um, nascent sector when it was founded in 2005, but, but it was a pioneer of nanosatellite construction. And in terms of significant digits, um, when I looked at the Scottish Economic Development Agency website, it said that Scotland was second only to California in terms of satellite manufacturing. Now, granted, that is not so easy to track as it was a couple of years ago because SpaceX is churning out satellites more than 100 a month in the state of Washington, and OneWeb is manufacturing satellites very rapidly in Florida. So um, it would be interesting to show the horse race of how many satellites are being produced around the world right now. Um, but Scotland is an important part of that because of AAC Clyde Space and also Spire Global has been um, manufacturing CubeSats in Scotland for 
since about 2015, or at least that's when they established a plant there. So it's an important part of this discussion. And in terms of launches, um, the UK has three spaceports with launches coming up in the next couple of years. At least that's the schedule. We know launches often slip. There's Spaceport Cornwall, where Virgin Orbit plans to fly this summer, Space Hub Sutherland in Scotland, and the Shetland Islands spaceport. So, so Scotland's an important piece of this new space, emerging space story. Well, that's great. Uh, again, thank you, Deborah. And um, I think you've given us a sense of you know, where Scotland fits in this, maybe not the, the new space empire, but certainly a, a big player as our industry continues to burgeon and, and grow forward. Um, so again, thank you so much for that report. Um, Joe, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Joe Fargnoli. Um, gee, I, I mean, the, the table has really been set by our journalists. I, I think we have a pretty clear picture of at least statistically uh, what's going on in the landscape there. Um, let's see what our panelists have to say and uh, what do you think? Yeah, first I wanna thank Space News as always for giving us uh, <clears throat> objective information on the state of the industry. And to, to get a little more up close and personal, I'd like to introduce our panelists today. We have a group of experts who I think will be very illuminating in talking about the, the details of the, um, the environment in Scotland for new space. I wanna start by introducing Dr. David Alexander, OBE. He's the director of the Rice Space Institute at Rice University and chair of the Aerospace and Aviation Committee at Greater Houston Partnership. He serves as a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, where his primary area of research is solar astrophysics. He has established a strong rice presence in the Houston space community and strengthened the institutional ties with the NASA Johnson Space Center, developed partnerships with local aerospace industries, and created a strong report with local, regional, and federal government leaders. Professor Alexander joined the faculty at Rice in 2003 from Lockheed Martin, where he was a staff physicist working on the development of advanced space missions for solar physics. In 2018, Professor Alexander became an officer of the most excellent order of the British Empire, OBE. This OBE was awarded to Dr. Alexander for his services to the US, UK links in the space industry and higher education. Welcome, Dr. Alexander. I also want to introduce Dr. Callum Forsyth, who is a VC investor currently with Techstart Ventures, LLP. Callum, is, uh, Callum sits on the investment committee. He focuses on pre-seed and seed stage companies predominantly based in Scotland and is sector agnostic in his outlook. Prior to this assignment, Callum was the founder of the Edinburgh-based Edinburgh Angel Fund Seed House. Callum is a former research scientist. He holds an MSCI in chemistry from the University of Glasgow and a PhD in organometallic chemistry from the University of Strathclyde, Glasgow. He lives in semi-rural central Scotland with his wife and daughters. Dr. Hina Khan is a UK stakeholder engagement and senior project manager. She leads Spire's UK stakeholder engagement with government industry and academic institutions, building strong relationships with key organizations to, pr to promote both SPIRE activity within the space sector and emerging across non-space domains. Hina also manages a large portfolio of technical programs with the ESA funded through the UK Space Agency to develop new technical capabilities and service offerings that are of commercial value. Hina has a PhD in space science and has worked in world leading organizations, including NASA, Goddard Space Flight Center, ESA, and MSSL, as well as leading universities. She has over 25 years of experience working across the space sector in the UK and represents Spire as a member of Space Scotland, working closely with the UK Space Agency and Scottish Enterprise to maximize the presence of Spire across UK. If you don't know Spire, they have built, own, and operate one of the world's largest multi-purpose satellite constellations to source hard to acquire valuable data, and they enrich it with predictive solutions. All of Spire's satellites are built in-house in their state-of-the-art manufacturing facility and testing facility in Glasgow, Scotland, which is home to over 100 engineers, scientists, and data analysts. 
Lastly, but not least, I'd like to introduce Daniel Smith, who's the Executive Director with the Spa Scottish Space Leadership Council and CEO for Astro Agency. Daniel is the founder of Astro Agency and Director of Space Scotland. He has established four space companies in the last four years and sits on the advisory board as a mentor for both UK SEDS and the New Voices in Space, as well as being the current co-chair of, of Space Scotland's Enter Environmental Task Force. He led the unveiling of Scotland's inaugural space strategy last year and is a passionate advocate for sustainable space, discussing the topic on CNN, BBC, and on stage at Expo Dubai, Korea Space Forum, UK Space Agency's Ignite Space, and COP26 events. He writes a column in the Scotman newspaper on the importance of ensuring the new space sector develops in a sustainable fashion. Thank you everyone for joining us. To get underway, I wanna bring everyone's attention to a great report that I'm actually putting out into the chat right now, which is called A Strategy for Space in Scotland. It was put out in 2021 by the uh, Scottish government. And it gives the vision that Scotland has. Humbly speaking, Scotland is the best place on earth to build a space business. That's the, the vision for space in Scotland. And it highlights some interesting points. Under current status, it says the latest, the latest Scottish Space Cluster 2020 report and UK Space Industry Size and Health report shows that Scotland already punches well above its weight in the space sector. We want to take a look behind some of these factors. There's four factors given in this paper. Scotland has a space industry estimated to generate 880 million pounds for the Scottish economy with an annual growth rate of 12% and an increase in employment of almost 10% since 2016. As Jason mentioned, Scotland is home to almost a fifth of all UK space sector jobs. And proportionally, Scotland employs over twice as many people in space as the rest of the UK. An impressive factor, the number of space businesses in Scotland has increased by more than 65% since 2016. In terms of ambitions, I love a big, a big vision. Scotland's vision for 2030 is to grow their workforce by 5x, to become a globally recognized strategic location and European leader for commercial space developments, to have a range of managed launch and orbital services supporting the highest launch cadence in Europe, and to have an increased and diverse workforce with improved participation that is fully reflective of Scottish society and ensures space is open to all. Great, great goals. So with that, I'm gonna turn over and ask the first question. The nature of this Space Business Roundtable today is to admire Scotland's accomplishments, but to take one step back and say, what makes a, a, a region, a country like Scotland desire to have a space economy versus all of the other great technical areas that a country can look at. And we ask the question, what in your history drives a country like Scotland to want to be a player in the space industry? Maybe David, you can take us off, uh, lead us off with uh, your response to that question. Well, you're asking me the question about how, does, how did Scotland invent the modern world and everything in it. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, I, yeah, I've been I've been in the United States for almost thirty years now, and um, it's great to see um, what Scotland's doing and as as a country. But it involves an awful lot of people. Some very few of them are on the line, but the very uh, uh, major contributions that they've made. But one of the things, the strengths of Scotland, I believe, is its education system. And for a small country, there are some really uh, top notch uh, universities. Um, and very early on, many of these universities focused on things like engineering and science. And I think that has led kind of in a nutshell to um, the role that Scotland has played and people from Scotland have played around the world um, as we've developed engineering projects, you know, from the early days of building bridges all the way today to building spaceships. So, so I think that's to me is, you know, without going into a long lecture on, on all the possible uh, other contributions, I think that to me is the thing that's helped us most. It certainly helped me. Um, in my career, you know, coming uh, coming through a great education system. So I don't know what the others feel, but for me, that that kind of captures the kind of foundation of a lot of the things that we do. I think if I can just jump in. I think we've also got that history of invention that was touched upon. It does go beyond golf, and that was a great video at the start. Um, I think Mrs. Doubtfire was based on a Scottish grandmother as well, by the way. Um, but yeah, that that engineering that that's science background, uh, the, the world-class universities that David's touched upon. In terms of space, 
not many people know that there's been suborbital launches from Scotland since the 1930s, which is always amazes me. Um, and Scotland's been part of, you know, big research missions, traditional space missions, most recently James Webb, but a long history of that as well, going, you know, going back a long way. So there is that heritage there. It does exist. We just aren't very good at shouting about it, I don't think. I think I would just add as well, I think it's that creativity um, as well, that kind of inspiration that, you know, along with that academic background, you know, and, and David and I kind of go back in, in, in a similar pathway that we, we've ended up in different ends of, of the spectrum within the sector. Um, but, you know, having that inqu inquisitive nature to be able to grow and, and diversify in the areas that we have excelled at has really allowed us to think quite creatively about where there are opportunities uh, that can grow within the environment that we're in, but also the, what, will, what will help advance the, the, the sector. You touched um, very briefly at the beginning, you know, the kind of how new space kind of had organically formed here uh, within Scotland. And it was really kind of thinking, well, where are the opportunities within a, a thriving space, global space environment, and where are the capabilities that can be targeted using the skill set and the ingenuity that, that people with, a, you know, within the UK, but specifically here in Scotland have to make that uh, direction a little bit more tangible. So I think bringing all those th things together really kind of plays to, to people's strength here in Scotland. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go through this discussion, but it's definitely helped me really kind of open up where I thought I was going to be to where I am today working in the, you know, an industry player, a commercial entity uh, within this, this segment of the, uh, of the space environment. Just hey, that, that, um, that, that adaptiveness and that responsiveness that he now alludes to there as well. I think it's a great point. You know, we're a very small country, so we're very lucky in that we can move quickly. And that aligns quite nicely with the kind of ideals of, behind new space and commercial space. Yeah. Uh, Caleb, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I, th I think I most agree with, with David's sentiment. Um, I should say I'm a journalist VC investor, so not deeply embedded in the space sector. Um, I would agree with the sentiment around education, not to get overly polit political and such a thing, but uh, tertiary education is free point of access in Scotland. So you do end up with quite a diverse workforce coming out of universities, which is quite interesting um, relative to other countries and how they populate things. I think um, you know stuff like Clyde Space has certainly helped. Um, I guess raise awareness of the industry. And what I'm always interested to see is, is folks parachuting in from uh, analogous industries. So people in historically the telecoms industry, people like Clyde Space are able um, to showcase these offerings. So um, yeah, there's there's some exciting stuff happening for sure. Let me let me stay there then, Callum, for a second. Um, and again, this this spreads across to each of you. Um, what you described and what David uh, described at the outset with regard to education and then talent creation is really the formation of an ecosystem. And so you get when Spire comes to town with Clyde there and so forth, you begin to build this uh, ecosystem that presumably attracts talent and finance. You know, I'm thinking of Suwon, South Korea, when, when you know, uh, Samsung located there, all of a sudden they built a university, 1,500 small businesses just flourished. And, you know, Suwon, South Korea is one of the most prosperous places on earth. Again, question for you, has, the, has an ecosystem that attracts both the talent you need from the outside as well and the financing been formed in your view in Scotland? And if not, uh, what level does it need to go to next? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. And I, I don't think there'll ever be a binary answer to such a thing. It will always be a work in progress. Um, we need to be mindful of the, the constraints that we have around us. We are, by definition, a small country. We are not going to have the gravity well um, and den network density that other, other cities and other countries will have. In terms of we are able to attract great students to excellent universities, many of whom stick around um, and, and work here. We're attracting interesting companies, um, you know, nodding to, to Spire, et cetera, and who are setting up operations here. I think, you know, something we see in other industries, there's something of a tipping point occurs in my experience where mm. if you were to relocate to another country, 
is there enough opportunity in other organisations should that role not play out? So if someone were to locate, uh, relocate to London, for example, in a generalist tech role, there are plenty of other tech companies of sufficient scale um, in London. Pointing at an ecosystem and, and, and an industry, I, I think that's an interesting tipping point. Are there other organisations that are an executive level individual could join in that ecosystem. I think that's the, the next thing to push through from, from my perspective, but um, the others around the table will have more, more insight um, specifically on the industry, I suspect. Yeah, Daniel, you wanna pick, pick up on that? Yeah, I think Callum's description of it being a work in progress is, is spot on really. Um, I think for financing, we've got some work, work to do really when it comes to private financing, but again, Looking at inward investment in that type of area, you know, to see what Spire have done and the figure earlier about Scotland and um, building more, I would say, small satellites rather than satellites outside of the US. I think it used to be California, but I'll need to speak to my, my colleagues to get that information updated. So now we see more satellites built in, in, in Glasgow than anywhere else in the world outside of the, the US. Uh, and that's thanks to, you know, companies like Spire coming in and, and making that contribution. Um, I think on the talent side, again, that's probably a bit further, further advanced. Uh, than the financing is. I think we're seeing some really interesting companies come in and some really strong, uh, you know, space minds from around the world coming to work for those companies or other space companies in Scotland. So it's encouraging, but clearly still a long way to go as well. Yeah, Dr. Khan, I, I just want to uh, sort of continue that that flow and to look at it from Spire's point of view. Uh, Jason Rainbow managed to uh, met, uh, referred to the challenging investment landscape, but it doesn't seem like there's that much of a challenged ecosystem because you guys went there. So, yeah. so talk to me a little bit about why you went there and, and what the investment landscape looked like from your perspective. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and, you know, it's a really interesting thing. You know, you know we talk about the ecosystem as, it, as it's developing over the last uh, decade or so. And, and you know, SPAR, uh, we're looking for a, a kind of European headquarters or operational site um, in, in 2015, 2016. And, and that's where we were. You know, they were looking at options across Europe because we, we kind of had the operations in San Francisco and we had a, a facility in Singapore. And so we were looking at where there was the, where was the footing that we would like to, to base uh, ourselves here within Europe. And, and as, it's important to say that Scotland was one of many sites which was being considered at, at the time. And, and the reason that Scotland kind of won out was really a combination of, of, of factors. Firstly, it was, you know, that uh, business ecosystem. So the opportunity to be able to leverage um, kind of local support, but also business, uh, the business environment was very uh, kind of encouraging and, and very supportive. You know, we're uh, account managed by Scottish Enterprise. We have links into Scottish government directly and we've been able to, 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 to kind of work together on a number of, of, of aspects which are of mutual benefit. But also what was happening in Scotland through the talent pool that we recognised and someone's um, mentioned in the, in the chat that Scotland's had a really you know, strong background in, in aerospace and, and telecoms. And you know, when we look at small satellites, all of the, the Spire satellites are based on, on software-defined radios. So we were really looking for expertise in that telecoms and electrical and, and mechanical engineering, all of which were, were key attributes within the university and educational environments that, that were, were on our doorsteps. So it was multiple aspects. The third part factor was, like you said, there was a budding kind of emergence of space within Scotland in, at, at that time. There was opportunities arising you know, you've mentioned ACC Clyde there already, but other opportunities, other uh, businesses were coming to fore and uh, beginning to, to leverage where space might add value. Um, also in the non-space sectors, you know, non-space people were starting to think, well, how can space add value to, to my business? And, you know, mm. one of Spire's greatest, you know, the, 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 our kind of Rosen Detra is about making space for good, you know, making space applicable and, and uh, accessible to, to those people who don't have a space heritage. So really it was all a combination of these things um, that kind of met the, the requirements that we had to really kind of make that foothold in, in Scotland. And since that time, I would say we haven't really looked back. We've opened offices elsewhere, but Scotland uh, remains our largest and, and you know core manufacturing facility. Um, and it's where we source our talent, both globally and, and in-house. You know? So retaining talent and bringing talent in, 
attracting them to Scotland is sometimes challenging, but when we when we have a conversation with them, we, we they, they recognise the value of being physically based here. So, you know, it's an ongoing thing that we do, but very much the ecosystem has supported our growth and, and we, we continue to to kind of output into that segment as well. Yeah, I can expand on the investment landscape if, if that's helpful for others. Sure. Particularly within the context of um, other geographies and other locations, I've, I've definitely seen a propensity for folks to try and attract investors to visit and to evaluate a location. The way we think about things as a VC fund based here, we encourage our founders to go out to the world. You, you don't base your you, you you don't restrict your customer base to the UK. Why would you restrict your capital to the UK? Um, people should be jumping on a plane, should be in London fundraising. Um, and I think sometimes there's maybe a little bit of a breakdown in, in understanding around how rounds come together, how companies fundraise. And I'm always keen to see people go out and engage with the Valley, with New York, London and Berlin, et cetera. Um, if there's a breakout success, you're guaranteed you're going to see a bunch of VCs running around Glasgow and Edinburgh. Um, you know, you've seen it in other industries and in other locations similar to Scotland. Um, but I would certainly encourage others to, to always have that outward focus. That the onus is on the company to go to investors in other territories, access those other networks, those other you know, insights right. that, that, that come from, from such a time. Um, Are you confident now that they'll always come back home or that they'll at some point, you know, like, like, like homing pigeons, they'll eventually come back? Yeah, I mean, it, it, people have different, um, different intentions. I mean, from my perspective, um, growing great companies is, is, is the name of the game. More often than not, the companies we engage with, um, they, they will have their presence in Scotland, they'll expand into other geographies. Right. Um, you know, there, there's normally a, a, a more personal reason that someone will want to stick around in Scotland. Um, and so it's, it's not necessarily about curtailing ambition or restricting um, what people can and can't do. Um, but oftentimes we found that you know that encouragement to engage with other other ecosystems, uh, particularly within the context of fundraising, people will often expect it to, to go in reverse and people should come to them. Whereas I'm, I'm a big proponent of encouraging founders and companies to go and seek capital out themselves. Absolutely, Joe. I think you're on mute. Um, in terms of uh, the past, Daniel, it, it sounds to me like companies like Clyde. The commercial sector was probably a little bit ahead of the game in terms of creating a space economy in Scotland, which is a great way to start. Um, it sounds like the, the, the governmental organizations are catching up and beginning to um, uh, recognize that there can be an environment here. Going forward, are there incentive programs that Scotland is putting together to attract entrepreneurs to Scotland or to attract investment to, to, uh, to Scotland? Yeah, and I think, you know, you mentioned the strategy, the Scottish strategy earlier on, and we talk about it, the kind of root of it all and, and how this all happened. How did we get to the stage where we have full value, we're developing full value chain capability from satellite manufacturing to launch, and of course, the strong downstream data segment as well. And it has been a kind of haphazard approach, and it's very much now about trying to turn that um, almost like a happy accident into a structured success, I suppose. Uh, so, yeah, I think it definitely was like a group grassroots level, companies like Clyde and Inspire coming over, some of the university work that we've, we've talked about already today. And now the government recognising, OK, there's something to this here. There's a great opportunity to be, you know, in on the ground level of one of the most exciting and, and, and fast growing industries globally. And this, the government has got right behind that um, in, a, in a variety of different ways. You know, we have our, our trade and export um, uh, development agencies that try to attract companies in like Spire and some other ones as well. Um, and yeah, just a really collaborative environment. The strategy that, that we wrote was, it wasn't government led, it was industry led, but it was in partnership with government and academia. And I think even that in itself, it's quite symbolic of the way we do things in Scotland. You know, we, are, we do try to stay close knit and it just allows us to make these decisions and, and go after what makes sense, you know, to be, to be responsive, like, like we talked about earlier. Joe, do you have another question on that? Cause I've got a follow go up ahead, on. Go right yeah, well, you know, it's, it's interesting because we, we do know uh, how Scotland collaborates with its government, um, you know, to move uh, industries forward. Um, it, it, if Deborah's still with us, you know, Deborah, um, you mentioned in your article, California has no state commission supporting the sector. So how how is it that a state like California can get away with it, but Scotland, you know, kind of 
kind of has to do it, it seems like, or, or do they? Well, California has such a history in this space. It has, it has these enormous uh, aerospace companies that have had hundreds of thousands of workers for a long time. And it's also got venture capital. It's, it's an amazing um, source of venture capital. So many, many companies I note come to Silicon Valley, get money because venture capitalists have said openly they don't want to travel. So companies start here and then move to lower cost states and countries to attract talent and build their businesses. So, so, so like Kalen was saying, you know, hey, come, come to Silicon Valley, um, you know, do what you need to do, but then make some decisions based on your, on your business model and your growth. And your article also said you, um, you're quoting our friend, <laughs> Sean Casey from Silicon Valley Space Ventures. Uh, and he said, you'll always pull them into Silicon Valley based on the fact that we have the money, but can you hold on to them? is the question. Uh, David, you're nodding your head. But you yeah, one, yeah. Sure I was unmuted there. Um, no, and I think I think a lot of the previous comments um, have been really on the money, you know, uh, no pun intended, but what Callum said and, and Daniel and, and, and so on. And I think I think one of the things I'd like to, um, sorry, that's my phone going, bring up is that we did emphasize a lot about how great Scotland is and so on, but a lot of countries have the, the skills and the capabilities and the resources that, that Scotland has. And so it's not unique to, to Scotland, but I think looking from the outside and seeing what they've done, they've targeted and they've organized into certain, certain areas. And so, so that's been important. Uh, one of the jobs I do is to try and connect um, connect Scottish companies over here in Houston and particularly uh, in around the United States. Um, and I think that, that that international outlook is something that all small countries need to take on board because, again, as, as Callum pointed out, the, the, there are limited resources, there are li limited customers. Um, and so you have to export not just your technology, but the knowledge that you bring and, and what you've learned on that. So I think that all told, uh, it kind of really helps. And, and the last thing I want to say on this topic anyway is that the government has also been really good in the last couple of years in promoting the fact that Scotland has a space industry. Scottish Development International, for example, in Houston was all about oil and gas. They have now stepped up and are really focusing a little bit more on, on the kind of space industry in Scotland. And then there's a, there's a thing called the Global Scott Network that have been put together, I happen yes. to be in that network. Yeah. And, um, and there, the idea is, and if I think Joanna Peters is online, and she and I together teamed up to help, um, you know, some companies who went to pitch in Dubai for at the expo, for example. So this network around the world helps Scottish companies connect into different, um, uh, you know, different uh, economies, different regions, different markets. Um, and that really has helped, and that, on the, the global Scott side, the space contribution has really grown and I think I was the first of the modern space global Scots there's now a lot of us and and I think that's been a targeted um, uh, you know a deliberate um, strategy of the Scottish government and taking advice from people like Daniel and and Hina and and Christina who's online too you know these have these folks have all made major contributions in corralling the different aspects of the Scottish space industry from your spires and and AC Clyde and, and so on um, so again, this is where I think the lessons maybe are for some of the audiences is, you know, the, it's about strategy that you develop and taking advantage of what you have, but also recognizing your limitations and working to, to fill those gaps. So, so I think that's one of the things that's making Scotland successful right now is the people um, and the strategy that they're, they're putting together. Yeah, Joe, it, it, it sounds like um, David's and, and, and Scotland has put together sort of a mafia. An international mafia, you know, but, like that, but what that ecosystem yeah. for developing a space environment and that's either happens that happenstance or very well thought out either way, it's proving effective. The question I have though, is about um, potential Scottish, what would we want to call it? Independence. Can you guys talk about the potential of Scotland separating from the UK and the impact that has on the development of a space industry? 
before you go on to that, I'm just going to go back one step. I'm not going to I'm not going to go to the independence question. I just wanted to pick up a little bit on, on the previous discussion. I think we've talked a lot about satellite manufacturing and satellite technology and and the technical aspect of it. But one of the things that Daniel touched on, and I think it's it's evident through the it's kind of strings through the strategy is that, you know, space is there to in, in essence, why do we all care? Why should we all care about space? It's because it actually has an impact in, in everything that we that we do. So making the link between what space gives us and how that can be leveraged into like things like, you know, the, the COP26 event which happened here in, in Glasgow and and how space can be a real enabler um rather than a rather than a, a, a hinderer to, you know, how we address the, the, the climate challenges and environmental conditions and, you know, how do we monitor and how do we make decisions? And I think it's it's that as well. So whilst we have and you know, Spire as a company, you know, we build and maintain a large constellation, but but why do we do that? We do that so that we can get data and resources and then provide added value through analytics and data analysis and data processing to actually give you solutions which can make a difference to to, to people as well as decision makers. And it's so it's, it, you know, that within Scotland, I think is quite unique where you have this entire capability of, you have people who are going to build your satellites and ultimately launch them from UK and, and Scottish soil but you also have those people who are adding value in making uh you know making uh, solutions and services which are then being uh, passed and delivered to uh, the decision makers to enact on them and then make policy changes uh, accordingly and that all happens here uh, in scotland and it's you know, I've, I've worked in the sector a long time. It's it's quite challenging to find another relatively small uh, environment is connected and able to provide that level of of solution and and service offering um, within within a, a community, which is essentially talking to each other and quite modest in in, in its uh, in its size and shape. Um, so it's leveraging that, and then you talked about what can be ex what can we take as an example. I think that's the example. It's how do you you can envelope that and and turn it into a package and be able to take it uh, to to other regimes and other other geographies. I'll let someone else talk about the independence mm -hmm. element. But well, yeah, I want to. Oh, yeah, I was going. We'll get back to the political question because Joe Joe's asking the real New York question here. But <laughs> Daniel, how how because Hina raises something uh, important here. How do you package that? Uh, how do you package that combination of talent, the network, obviously the companies that are there? Uh, Hina talked earlier about how she hopes Spire kind of spreads out uh, the technology so that other types of industries sort of catch it and you uh, develop these regional clusters that Jason Rainbow spoke of. How do you how do you do that? Is there is there is there a package that exists? Well, it's, it's a tricky one because I think, you know, and I would say this as the, the guy that runs the space marketing agency, but space does have a bit of a marketing problem and it's not very good. It's great at talking among forums like this and, you know, other space related forums where we talk to ourselves and we're really good at talking about all the benefits of space and, and you know, whether it be economic or, or, or society or environment. Um, but we're not so good at getting that message out beyond the space sector. So he has a point around getting other you know, industries, other sectors to, to recognize the opportunities, whether that be in being part of the supply chain or whether that be in benefiting from downstream insights. It's a really key element and it's something we need to work on. We're not doing well enough yet, um, but it's something that, that I'm really passionate about and I think we have to do. So developing that package, you know, the strategy helps and it got a lot of publicity and what we did in Dubai got a lot of publicity. The regional approach is something the space agency are really promoting in the UK. So they're encouraging different regions to, to create their own, you know, promotional and um, their branding essentially. So that then ties into the wider UK proposition, which maybe brings us back to the independence question. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, you do need to create that package and then you need to get it out there. And that seems to be the tricky part. Uh, so, how, so how would you communicate the virtue of the satellite proposition and we try to do it all the time through our better satellite world campaign i mean we tell people if it wasn't for satellites there would be no relief services when there's a, a war in europe or a disaster a, a natural disaster in haiti um bill gates says he doesn't cure polio in india without satellites i mean you don't get energy without satellites you don't you don't watch television without satellites. isn't is there a way that you create the tip of that spear to have that discussion for scotland yeah, I mean, I think I think it's starting to happen, and the, we talked earlier about the the growth of the jobs, you know, the, the proportion of Scottish jobs and how they're at Scotland's leading in the UK. That was covered by BBC News, and people are talking about that now. 
Um, I remember I got a taxi recently and the taxi driver said to me, you know, what, what do you do for a job? And I said, well, work in space. And he said, do you know that Glasgow builds more satellites outside the US and anywhere else in the world? Is that right? Really? Yeah, the word is getting out. So the word is getting out, yeah. We're making a start, but still nowhere near, nowhere near enough. Yeah. Um, my, yeah. That's my, my uncle actually used to accuse me of taking up time and space in university, David, but I don't think he meant exactly what Daniel said. No, but I, but I, think, I think also the I think also the international networks that we that we've talked about the global Scott networks and and forums like this and and you know it's it's building that that awareness the, the spaceports I mean across the UK have been a, a source of good actually because part of the the challenges the spaceports have had is really to work very closely with communities and to get them on board a lot of the the yes. spaceport locations are 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 in you know ones in Scotland anyway are in rural communities and you know they don't want a big massive rocket it going off every you know three to six weeks or whatever off their land if it's going to cause a disruption to their ecosystem and, and things like this. So there's there's been a lot of work in that segment anyway to try and ensure that there's partnerships between communities and and what's happening in the sector. And then that naturally then flows. Well, what is space add? How do you add val? How do you gain value from it? And I've been involved in a number of discussions, uh, you know, with 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 you know school children and students about you know space for good. How does it affect our lives exactly? Right in the same way that you've mentioned so I think it is slow but it's it's not just um you know a problem within Scotland I think it is a is it, it is a a global thing I think we do talk not so within the space community globally we don't talk enough about how we do it and I think you've also got the the, the other side of it where space is still considered by from a public perception the remit of very large nasa's ESAs, and 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 uh, you know jaxas of the world it's you know big satellites buses bus size satellites which take you know decades and hundreds of billions and billions of dollars or euros to to prepare um obviously there's value in some of those from the scientific side of things but I carry a satellite when I go and do STEM events or, or engagement events in schools and, you know, the students are blown away by the fact that you've actually got a satellite in your suitcase. Yes, I do. This is it here. And so it's 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 kind of, uh, you know, kind of providing that, um, you know, that that other side of that discussion on what space can give you. Yeah, that's that's not a toothbrush. That's a satellite. Maybe. <laughs> um, and Lou, Lou, I would say I would say that in some senses, it's your job, right? I mean, SSPI, yes, and absolutely. I think you understand the challenges. I mean, I was just in Edinburgh last week and visited the Science Centre there, and they actually have school children working on CubeSats. Um, so they're actually starting to integrate it in not yeah. just the formal education, but the informal education side of things. And um, I mean, I think the challenge for us all, you know, with, with this is, um, I gave a talk to a digital conference in Scotland a couple of years ago, and I basically said every company there was a space company, whether they knew it or not, just because of the range of technologies that we need. And I think that, that what's happened, and we see this in Houston, you, we see this in Houston where space is kind of the norm. It's like, it's not as cool as it used to be. Right. I mean, we had that we had a, a, a live downlink from the space station uh, last year um, with schools in Scotland, in Ecuador and in Houston. In Scotland, the newspapers were all over it. In Ecuador, the newspapers were all over it. In Houston, I know the reporters personally and I could not get them interested. Right. Just another another astronaut talking to another group of children. And so this is this has become we, we, we forget that we're connected to space, that we're connected to space right now in this conversation, because that's where the signal goes. Right. So somehow we need to get across that space is embedded in our daily lives and that life would change dramatically if we didn't have satellites and the stuff. And I know you do this and you do a great job in doing all of this and so on. The audience, we end up I think we end up in a bunch of bubbles. And we end up just with overlapping bubbles, but there's still, you know, 7 billion people there who don't get the message. So, so there's yeah. a lot of work to be done. No, it's, it's, it's true. I mean, in Houston, when you say, you know, uh, there was a launch or whatever, it's kind of like saying um, in Detroit, oh, we made a car today. Right. So I think people do kind of take for granted the miracle. Um, I, I think we're coming up on time here. Uh, Joe, they didn't answer your question. Um, which I think was ultimately how did Scotland how does Scotland form a space identity apart from the UK? Maybe that's the way to do it, rather than the, uh, the tough political question that I. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand how political that was, but <laughs> I think that Scotland is pulling its weight and is uh, uh, standing up for its own space interests, which are great. Um, as I go over kind of what we covered today, 
Um, you know, first I want to thank Space News for their significant digits report. Very informative. Um, I heard a great uh, statement from David about the importance of universities in the uh, Scottish ecosystem. And it reminds me of a quote I heard once that said, if you want to build a great city, start a great university and wait 200 years. <laughs> So I think that the, uh, the success we're seeing in Scotland right now is probably on the shoulders of giants who've uh, preceded us all and established that great university system in Scotland. Um, we talked a bit about the uh, impact of the space economy in Scotland and it's actually a, a bright picture. Um, hopefully lots of young people stay in Scotland wanting to pursue the space economy. And one of the really prevailing words that I heard was ecosystem. And the ecosystem in Scotland is not something that was top down. The government didn't dictate it. It came from the hearts of the entrepreneurs, the, the space entrepreneurs, what we call astropreneurs in Scotland who had a, a passion for developing the space industry. And the government kind of caught up to those leaders and is now taking ownership over helping to nurture and sustain the system. So I think there's a message here for any other country or state out there that wants to be active in space, start with a great educational system let your let create a system where free entrepreneurs can run and uh, create value and realize that you know there's there's risk and reward to that but create a system where entrepreneurs can do their thing and have the government be ready to come in and support and grow and nurture that ecosystem sounds like a pretty good formula for uh, other countries to take take up and then lastly market it right create an awareness of space as a real sector of the economy adding a lot of value so there you go. There's a formula that I think any country or state can learn by following what I'll call the Scottish space formula. So that that is the formula we've we've put out today. Um, we'll thank you, Joe. We'll be asking our big question uh, of our panelists and the audience in a few seconds. But first, I um, I also want to thank you, Joe, for uh, being a part of this as always. And what we'll do now is just, I want to give everybody a, a little snapshot of what's coming down the road uh, at SSPI and elsewhere. Um, in next month, we'll be continuing to talk about nations in space with a um, discussion with Taiwan. If Taiwan goes, does commercial space go with it? Which is a pretty significant question to ask. And we'll have with us the CEO and founder of Taiwan's Tensor Tech, Thomas Yen along with uh, More Ventures general partner, Darius Sankey. Uh, Darius was the uh, former president of Ocean Tomo China Technology, which many of you know about. And also we'll have with us Stealth Wars author uh, and Sempra CEO, uh, United States Air Force Brigadier General, the retired Dr. Robert Spaulding and representative uh, of the Taiwan government to talk about uh, this rather big issue because Taiwan is absolutely instrumental to the global ecosystem of space. Um, later in this month, if you're not making mistakes, you're not making decisions, Catherine Cook, the founder of uh, Social Network My Yearbook said, uh, it is the sign of leaders to make decisions as you've heard today, of course. On April 28th, SSPI's Women in Space Engagement Cohort, uh, SSPI Wise, will hear from a Hall of Fame leader who is fearless in blazing a new path for satellite broadcasting as the vice president of network broadcast operations and engineering for ABC television. And then as the president at Globecast United States uh, unit. Uh, so join Mary Frost and now the CEO of Power to Change Us at 11 o'clock next Thursday, next Thursday, for the monthly meeting of the SSPI WISE group. The mentoring working group invites women in space and satellite to her uh, special presentation on presentation skills. Um, I mentioned World Teleport Association is a supporting partner of our organization. And we'd like to thank Randy and his group for that. Um, look for a new report soon to be released by WTA um, titled uh, Pros and Cons of the Leo Gateway Business. The association interviewed teleport operators uh, in the UK and elsewhere, and the Leo executives responsible for gateway development to kind of explore the current and potential business opportunities and what capabilities teleports must bring to win the business. So I'm sure you folks from Scotland will wanna pay attention to that because it does represent an important aspect of the ground segment. For more information, uh, visit World Teleport, it's one word, worldteleport.org. Okay, 
every Monday if you want to listen to me more, and why the heck would you? But please do if you can. Uh, my podcast, The Better Satellite World Appears. We'll be wrapping up our series on satellites uh, in Ukraine uh, this coming Monday with a conversation uh, with the representative from the United States Department of Homeland Security. Uh, if you haven't heard the previous podcasts, including one with Space Intel Report Editor-in-Chief, the legend Peter DeSelding, check it out at sspi.org or uh, wherever you get your podcasts. So thank you for that. That's what's going on, and we hope you continue to be a part uh, of it. Okay, Joe, on to our big question. Um, Tamara, I'm going to turn it over to you to lead us uh, and help us out to ask this big question and to get some answers. Absolutely. So uh, first of all, thank you to all of our panelists. This was a really fantastic discussion. I learned a lot. And I also learned that uh, I, I had a great deal of fun in the chat box with somebody posting, beam me up, Scotty. All kinds of awesome. Um, we're now in our big segment, uh, big question segment. Uh, what's going to happen is I am going to remove um, the block on the ability to chat and we're going to give uh, the ability to uh, unmute is what I mean to say. And so if you would like to answer the big question or ask a question of our panelists, you can just use the raise your hand function. Um, it is at the bottom, bottom of or top of your screen, depending if you're in Windows or Mac environment, under the section that's called reactions, there's an opportunity to raise your hand and we will call on you so that you can ask a question or answer the big question. And the big question that we are asking is, is commercial space investment and promotion a winning strategy? So we've been focusing on how to play this out for countries and um, yeah, countries, mainly countries, but communities generally speaking. So have at it. I'm going to now go ahead and uh, allow us to all unmute and if there are any questions, please jump right in. I, I also want to flag that I have, I have a note that, um, let's see, see if I can find it. Okay, so Julie has put Christina on the spot. And so if Christina is still here, <laughs> Christina, I would love for you to jump right in and talk a little bit about introducing introducing Scotland's space capacity, because Julie said you're the person to talk to. Jesus Christ, Julie, what are you telling lies for? <laughs> <laughs> what was your question, Julie? To the panel, surely. Well, no, it was just a comment that um, our company, um, with uh, I guess six or seven other Canadian companies, participated in a UK tour um, looking at um, different space centres within Scotland, England, Wales. Um, and so for us and our company, the best match was with Scotland. And that presentation was led by Christina and um, different people that they brought in. And so it was very, very helpful. I guess I am a, a first generation person that is, has experienced um, such a reaching out to the global world to say, you know, Scotland is open for um, space business. And of particular interest to us was just, um, and I guess maybe this is a social worker part of me, but they were very open to collaboration. That spirit of sharing, of giving help, of, and of course they have a specialist team that's involved with the data lab, which of course is really important to us. Data visualization, um, we use the satellite imagery to um, penetrate the surface of the earth. So we do subsurface work, which is very um, advanced and unusual. So for us, we were interested in the capacity to build the satellite, but that wonderful capacity to be able to go to the next level, to grow our business with their expertise and experience and all of those educated people to help pull us along. And so if you want to have that kind of experience, then I would keep bugging Christina and her team and whoever else you know on this panel to have discussions about what it can mean for your company in particular, because that has produced a lot of excitement and a lot of imagining forward. I can see our company 
um, relocate or not relocating, but having another office in um, Scotland um, within the next six months. Oh, you definitely that be. Was, that was how um, inspirational um, that experience was for our company, being able to see the potential of how we could grow um, in that environment. Oh, you'd be definitely very welcome to come to Scotland and we'd love to have you in Edinburgh and uh, the dream team you've got on the call here Julie is how we do it it's honestly we uh, as Daniel said early on it's, it's um we just all talk to each other and help each other out and you're right we're very much on the collaborative side um with colleagues I'll hand over to Hina and Daniel who are actually on the panel and hide behind the scenes again yeah, Christ Christina what would, just just out of, just out of what would be the first step for Julie or somebody else Talk to me. Well, it depends on the. It depends on the uh, on what they ask us. If you're hoping to locate into Edinburgh or anywhere in Scotland, it's speaking to SDI or Space Scotland, which is the industry group that uh, all of us sit on. Uh, so Hina, Daniel, and I um, to have a, just a discussion about what you want. But it's it depends on what your needs are. So if you want to find out about the kind of business opportunities, um, a Scottish Development International are very good for that. Uh, if you want to speak to universities, then uh, people like me exist in most universities, so you can have a conversation with the business development unit, which is what I um, had up. And then, and yeah, and if you want to work with companies, then people like Daniel is very good because he knows the whole of the space sector. Yeah, and what's the uh, website if people want to visit that now while we're talking? I, I will drop a link in the chat. Thank you. And Lou, Lou Christina's underselling herself a little bit because she's... I would a, see she's exactly that. She's How unusual. A, she's the Christina I mentioned earlier. Um, and, you know, the panel could only have so many people and there's a lot of great people helping the Scottish um, space economy and Christina is right up there with with the others that we're talking to now. So so I appreciate um, uh, Julie mentioning that because I think there are many entry points into Scotland, but they are being coordinated by Space Scotland, which is Daniel, of course, and Christina is a big part of that. And then, of course, Hina. And I mean, it's just it is a really small um, but well-focused community who uh, really talk to each other. So um, if we had a room for another three people on the panel, um, we could easily fill that without too much sweat. Yeah, we'll have to do this again. Hey, Daniel, just, I, I know you wanted to say something. For example, what if what if I want, I love Dundee. I think Dundee's a great city. I mean, I, I was there a couple, many years ago, but if, if I wanted to, if Joe and I wanted to locate our new space business in Dundee, what would, what would you, how would you direct us? Hey, Lou, which one? Which one of our new space businesses are you talking about? Oh, well, you know that one. Okay, that one. Yeah. Um, I'll, yeah I'll, I'll help you I, out, Daniel, if you need. <laughs> yeah, well, I was just going to say, I mean, uh, Christina's made some good points about SDI. And Dundee, there's already some great space stuff happening there already. Um, the interesting thing I mentioned in the chat is that we've got this kind of cluster approach in Scotland where we've got different clusters that are emerging. The central belt being satellite manufacturing data and obviously launch around the south and the highlands and islands. But Dundee has is, is developing with the university there and with companies uh, yeah. like Gore, uh, Gore Tech, who I'm sure you guys know because a big presence in the US uh, and also star Dundee and companies like that. So yeah, SDI or the government agency that would help with some incentives, I'd imagine, but maybe Hina can, can add something there. Yeah, yeah no, I just know. wanted to. I just wanted to kind of add, and and just touching on what what Julie said, I think what's and it's it kind of what I tried to maybe articulate, maybe not so clearly uh, previously. It's how we manage to kind of link the space companies with those people who can leverage what space has to offer in their own in their own businesses. So whilst we're keen to obviously you know grow the space community, it's also getting businesses who can use what space has to offer and be able to to build their business based on what is already ready ready here so i mean i'd love to talk uh you know shop with with julie later on beyond this this conversation because you know she's looking to develop something which has a space app a space application or she'd require you know looking at data and visualizations from space then you know there are capabilities within scotland who can enable that for you you know almost give you a service offering um as an easy access to, to, to space combined with you know the the investment opportunities and the the business support that that comes from local enterprise agencies uh, and government so you know whilst we are looking to grow the space capacity within within scotland and and make it a tangible and uh opportunistic area for people to to come to we're also very interested in those people 
people who can use what's already here. You know, use cap capabilities through the data analytics, through the manufacturing. Mm. Don't build your own space, you know, launch platform. Use what's already here, a network analysis, a network platform that is there for you to be able to get the value that you want to progress your business rather than having to be bogged down in all the periphery that is required to get that get that uh, information from uh, to, to 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 get what you want to at the end of the day. So I think it's it's combining all those different things and and SDI and and Space Scotland are excellent avenues to give you that broad remit of what is here already, where there is capability to plug into, but also where the locations are which might be of greatest value for for your business. Um, yeah. So yeah, definitely you know things to talk more about. And, and Callum, you have to think creatively too, right? I, I refer to Dundee, but I, I believe that one couple of years ago, they were rated one of the best, most desirable places for scientists to live in the world outside of some places in the United States. So as an, so as, as you're looking for opportunities, would you, would you say to someone, hey, you go up here because I think your application has a, uh, an opportunity to graph some of the scientific data onto it and maybe to, to build a company that way. And if that happens, I will fund you. Does that does that kind of stuff happen in Scotland? Um, not not so much in terms of that. Um, at a very early stage, we would tend to see things either that have come through universities or folks in our network have uh, introduced. So in some occasions, we'd perhaps get a nod from someone that said an entrepreneur has relocated here and is looking to do X, Y, and Z. Um, but Oftentimes, as, as pre-seed and seed stage investors, we're investing in rounds that are sort of sub $3 million. Um, so we've got um, decent assets under management, but as pre-seed seed stage, it's unlikely we would be engaging with someone who's coming via an inward investment route. Um, but there are, um, you know, going back to your sort of life sciences point and uh, indeed the video games industry uh, comes to mind. Yeah. Dundee. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are there are certainly hot hot spots, and uh, again, similar to to other ecosystems, um, networks super important. So we're, we're in a privileged position to across the the fund have a pretty good network. Um, but today's been fantastic. I, I don't know many folks in this industry, so selfishly, I've I've got a lot from this. Right, um, great place to play golf too, um, David. I, um, I'm interrupting just briefly. We sorry, are yeah. we're we're right at, towards the end. We've got four minutes left in this segment. So I just want to flag it. So the next question or comment is probably the last. <laughs> okay, um, I, I had one for David, but Jody, I'll give you the last uh, question. David, I, I also want to just give you a very special Drew, shout you're out. You're on a roll, please continue. <laughs> okay, uh, you were thinking about our business that we're going to bring to Scotland, aren't you? Um, David, just first of all, shout out. Uh, when I reached out to you about putting this together, we, you know, you, you know, you never say no, and you really organize something that was great here. So this is all about what you and, and Rice uh, University have been able to do. So I, I wanted to make sure I shouted you out on that. Um, and I will give you the last uh, question. Um, is, there, is there now a connection between the Space Institute at Rice and some of the things that we've been talking about with our friends here today uh, in Scotland? Have you, have you built a bridge that is a useful one uh, for people who might be thinking about well, coming think, to Rice? I think so. I mean, I, well, I was just in Edinburgh, University of Edinburgh with Christina and our colleagues last week. Uh, we just signed our partnership agreement between the two universities. Um, so my president and provost were out with us. Um, 2016, we actually signed a memorandum of understanding between the Houston Spaceport and Presswick. Um, and so we're revisiting that now that Presswick has come out of some of the some of the, the problems that they were having. And I've, I've got some investment from the Ayrshire Growth deal. Um, talk to the people in Saxavord, which is a Shetland spaceport, quite a lot. Um, so, yeah, we're all over the place. You know, I'm actually visiting. I'm going to hold something up. This is a piece of tartan from a, an organization called Halo Kilmarnock. Uh, Kate. Uh, Kate Rubens just came by yesterday for coffee and delivered the tartan that she'd taken to space when on her last trip. Huh. So I'll be delivering that um, uh, in June. And so, so we have lots of different connections um, and lots of ways. Uh, Wendy Lamons is online. We've connected her to a couple of people. It's just, there's a lot of really great companies in Scotland, not all space companies, but have technologies that space could uh, be interested in. And that's where I kind of, Braided Communications is on that little uh, Infinity system. That's one of Callum's uh, companies. 
um, supporting. Um, so there's lots of different things that come into play and, and knowing people like uh, Daniel and Hina and Callum and, and Christina and others really helps make those connections. I think Houston's a great place for Scottish companies to get connected to. So lots. Very <laughs> yeah, very good. Well, Tamara, um, first of all, thank you everyone for, for being a part of this. We appreciate you making the time for us. Um, so late in the day for, for most of you. And uh, we hope to see you again. And we hope you stay close to SSPI and the New York Space Business Roundtable. Tamara, um, is commercial space investment and promotion a winning strategy? I'm going to go with absolutely. And that's the more polite version. So, yes. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, everyone. Uh, again, thank you very much. Joe, thank you again for riding along here. And uh, where we are, wherever you are speaking, don't forget, our job is to make it a better satellite world. So take care, everybody. We'll see you on May 18th when we talk about Taiwan. Take care, everyone. Thank you all. That was terrific. <laughs>